This is the ELTE 260 Module M, and what we're talking about is how Siemens function blocks work with um, HMIs for more advanced control. Our uh, PowerPoint's been downloaded here. Obviously, you've downloaded that and selected this video. You're going to pause it a few times to um, watch a few more videos and fill a lecture worksheet and then turn in lecture worksheet. So here's our outcomes. What's the difference between a Boolean and a data type? Describe how in, out, and in, out parameters work with regards to function blocks. And these are my local tags. What is the purpose of an I.O. field and an HMI? And let's start with our review from the Siemens HMI lab. So just to review, functions do not have memory. Function blocks have memory and remember their last operation. When you schedule a function block, it is assigned a data block, a DB. And in the DB would be um, the status of the local tags. So that's very critical in today's uh, lab to understand the data blocks. Um, data blocks can be global and all program can access the data in that data block. So when we schedule that function block, we get a data block. We can look into that data block and we can access the status uh, of the data that's in there. And once again, function blocks can be called by the OB or by another FC or an FB or whatever. They're just subroutines that can be called within subroutines. So let's just have a little refresher here with uh, global versus local tags. We're going to program three different ways to turn on a push button. One turns on a light. So why don't you go ahead and, and watch this video right here. And uh, you can see how uh, that goes. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Let's review the, the lab. So for the first HMI lab, um, we put a circle on there and we added an animation to it and we gave it a, a bit so that that circle, that imagine, it's kind of imaginary. We assigned an M bit, which is kind of imaginary and it was acting as an imaginary output. So we just programmed right into the ladder logic that if um, this M bit came true, the circle switched states from zero or one. Um, we added an event to a button and assigned that as an M bit so that the button the, on the screen is kind of fictional and the M bit is kind of fictional and it was kind of a fictional input and we just added that to the ladder logic so we could have a fictional input turn on a fictional output on the HMI screen. We added an animation to a circle to monitor the state of the real push button. Now this was different. The circle was just looking to see if push button one had been pressed and it, and it was kind of monitoring the input so if the input was true then the circle is changing state now, and this did not involve ladder logic this was just monitoring the state of a push button kind of like a bingo board hmi tags so um we associate the hmi elements with the plc tags so we went into the hmi and built the screen and then we went in and we selected the plc tags once we tag a button, for example, it creates an A HMI tags that references that association. So now we have a local HMI tag because um, it's kind of treating the, HM, the HMI kind of like a subroutine. Um, and that local tags look back uh, to where we pulled them out of the PLC tags. It generates these, these local tags that we then used um, on the HMI screen. Um, motor starting lab review. So on the motor starter it was pretty ba pretty basic. We had um, we used the auxiliary contact for the memory so that's that's real. We didn't use a fictional memory. Um, and what we also did is we used the auxiliary contact to tie that to a button animation so that the HMI was saying that it was running or that it was stopped. And why did we use um, the auxiliary contact to do that instead of just the fictional motor output or the even the output cue. Well, the reason we did that is just because we turned on the motor and, and let's say the cue of the motor is on that output, that doesn't necessarily mean that the motor's on. For example, we, we might not even have a motor starter hooked up to that. And if the cue is on, then it looks like the screen would say that hey, 
the motors on. Okay. If we use the auxiliary contact to animate that that HMI to say whether it's running or not, well then the HMI at that point is actually monitoring the condition of the motor starter. If the motor starter is on, the auxiliary contact is actually closed and that would give us the, the motor run indicator. And if the auxiliary contact was open, that means the motor starter is off, likely, and then we could say that um, it was off and, and indicate that. And we looked and we figured out invert bit which was acting like a toggle and an invert while pressed was acting like a momentary uh, push button. You had a quiz. You want to be sure that you understand uh, what was going on with the last quiz. Um, we talked about processes from um, our reading. We have a continuous process and um, that's maybe like an auto, an old, an automobile assembly where the car goes down and you put down the ch the frame and then you add the motor to it and then you add the chassis and you add the seats. It just kind of goes from one operation to the next. And our continuous process of the 260 capstone, there will be a process where one thing happens, then the next thing, and then the next thing, and the next thing. And so it's just continuously kind of working down the ladder logic or working down the process. A batch process, on the other hand, um, might be um, the number of chocolate chip cookies or the number of chocolate chips we want to put into the cookies and we can incorporate an HMI so that we can change up the recipe for that batch process to make um, more dough less or more cookies less cookies like that okay um, comparing our control so we have centralized and what we have there is a central PLC if the PLC goes down, the, the system completely fails. So this is a picture of the flex down here. And the flex has over here a master PLC. Well, if the master PLC goes down, everything's going to go down here for sure. Okay, But this also has zone PLCs, and that's distributor. If there's multiple PLCs, each PLC controls a, mach a machine the, and, and all the I.O. that's with it. And so these zone PLCs, there's there's three other zone PLCs here. Um, those PLCs run the zones. So even if um, this conveyor over here and this robot is faulted, well, this conveyor and this robot can keep working and it will keep working because this has its own uh, PLC that's independent of these. But once again, these are all tied back together to the master PLC that is a centralized PLC. And if that fails, everything fails. Control functions. Um, there's a lot of sensors that we work with. So far, we've only been working with digital sensors. Um, there's also analog signals that we'll talk about a little bit. Digital is off and on. Analog can have a range. Um, HMI that allows uh, human input into the PLC, and we can also monitor. Um, there's signal conditioning that we do, and that con converts um, your I/O to something meaningful to the PLC. Um, actuators, and that signals uh, movement, whether we're doing a rotational or linear movement. Uh, rotational, we do, we're doing motors, essentially, and for linear, we'll be doing valves, which activate cylinders. Those are probably the most typical ones there. And then, remember on the controller, it takes the inputs, it solves the logic, and it updates the outputs to match the logic. So that's kind of the basic PLC scan. Um, we've talked about a few idiosyncrasies of that with this more advanced controller but essentially that's still what's happening or what we want to happen take a look at the input solve the logic and update the outputs HMI screens um, we showed you on the flex there's a variety of different things um, there's the trend values that just monitors the process of how it's going um, and the operational summary to you tell you how many parts you're making or if everything's working like it should be and then there's the alarm si summary here that uh, we showed, which was red. And that was your time-stamped alarms uh, indicating when the system stopped or what action was taken. Data types, we've uh, reviewed this. <coughs> uh, we'll do it one more time. So mostly we've, we've been using Boolean data types, which are 0 or 1. And this is for our digital light inputs and outputs, such as our push buttons and our lights. Um, S-I-N-T, I-N-T, D-I-N-T, and real. These are other data types. This has eight bits, eight zeros and ones. And so you could get 
you know, 11100110101. That's 8. And that gives our values of negative 120 to 127. An integer or register, a lot of times we're talking about 16 bit registers, or a word here, is uh, 0 to 15. Uh, because there's 16 bits and gives a much larger binary number and then we have a double word here which is 32 bits zeros and one zero one zero one zero one up to uh, you get to 32 of those and that gives us very big numbers and then there's real which is our floating point arithmetic which puts a decimal in there and uh, puts an exponent in there so that's where you can get actual numbers um, these are all whole numbers up here Siemens data types look like this. <laughs> Inputs, we've certainly been using I, 0 0.0, 0 0.1, outputs Q, and internal bits M. So this is mostly where we've been working at. We did some timers and counters. So the counters, uh, we're working with the INTs. So when you talk about the data type there, they call that an IW0, a QW0, and an MW0. Okay? And the timers use double words here. And their double words are ID, QD, and MD. Okay, and once again, here's the double word. Um, your dents, your ints, your booleans, it's shown there. But the data types um, for the timers and counters are going to be important here because as we start working with counters, you want to know that the data type is an int. And the timers, um, the data type is the dent. And this relates to the count values and the time values not not whether it's off or on off or on are still going to be booleans there okay so <laughs> hmi control of a uh, function block we talked that plc tags are global and a lot of times this is your inputs and outputs function block tags are local you make up your own names inside of the function block and they uh they exist just inside of the function block and they're, they're local, they're kind of fictional. PLC tags and subroutine local tags can be used with an HMI screen. So we did that, where we made an HMI screen, let's say we put a button on there, and so that button we could, e we could directly tag to um, I 1.0 or 0 0.1 or 0 0.5 or 1.3. We could tie that button, we could make a, we could write some ladder logic that would control that or we could do a PLC tag with that button being M0.0, M0.1, M0.2 and that would be a PLC tag associated with that. Okay. Um, or what we could do is we could put that button on the screen and we could associate it with a local tag. Okay, and that's what this lab is about is taking that button on the screen and associating it with a local tag instead of a global I, Q, or M, okay? Just wanna remind you that function blocks can be used more than once, okay? And so when you use them, you have to schedule them so that you get another data block, so that the, the data that's inside of that function block is different than the when we use the function block the first time. So here's a couple of activities, of function block activities. You want to go ahead and um, watch this video and, and see if you understand that. <laughs> okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to add uh, HMI I.O. fields. And so these are used to monitor or initiate digital s switching in the HMI can. That's mostly what we've been using it for, just digital switching. But we can also input non-boolean numbers for example we can do a timer and a counter preset that's that's not pushing a button that it's on or off we can actually put in the timer of like uh, four seconds or two seconds or we can make the counter six or eight or whatever okay and so that is the primary function of an HMI is to be able to call up these recipes and change the number of values needed to execute that function block okay what do I mean? Well, here's a couple of other activities here if you want to watch these and understand how they work. So here's what's really important. Your global versus your local tags. <laughs> Maybe you'll follow. The program doesn't mind global PLC tags tied to the HMI. We can make an HMI button, put a circle on there, and we can call it M0.0. 
and then we can program ladder, ladder logic that uses M0.0. That's not a problem. HMI works fine with that. The program doesn't like trying to access timer programmed in the main OB. So if you put a timer into the main OB, and then what you want to do is you want to go in and you want to access the timer um, done bit, which would be the Q bit or the timer IN, which would timer.in. It's not going to like that. You're not going to be able to um, tie this to the HMI. What you'd have to do is you'd have to have the timer, when it gets done, turn on the, the Q, turn on a bit like we talked about in lab, and then you could tie that into the HMI. But what we want to do is we want to pull that tag right out of the DB. And so in order to do that, you have to use a timer programmed in the fun in the function block. And then once you do that, you're probably going to unconditionally schedule the function block. So basically you're just going to take all your normal ladder logic and instead of programming it to the main, you're just going to program it into a function block and then you'll schedule unconditionally the function block. And so when you do that, it will create a DB. And then in that side of that DB, you can then go from the HMI and associate the data in the DB directly to the HMI, kind of what was shown on the previous slide. But if you put the timer in the main, you're going to have problem accessing the data directly out of the timer. You'll get immediate reads on the timer and stuff like that. It's just not going to work the way that you want it to work. So you have a cylinder uh, lab. It's, you probably want to start by uh, taking out your cylinder solution from your Allen Bradley. Basically, the cylinder has the limit switches. The limit switches um, indicate that the part is extended and retracted. And you're going to use um, the HMI to enter the number of times that you want to cycle. You want, you're going to enter, use the HMI to enter how long it stays extended and how long it it stays retracted okay and you'll probably want to work with a partner on this because it's uh, somewhat complicated but you want to start with your uh, solutions or look back on the other videos in this series to see what the solution for the cylinder was and then see how you can modify it for the HMI um, there's a quiz for this unit and then a lab